Hello, I'm Dr. Ralph DeFranco, and I'm Professor of Medicine and Chief of the Diabetes Division at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio, Texas. This presentation is part one of a series called Shifting the Clinical Inertia Paradigm, a proactive and individualized approach sponsored by AstraZeneca. In this chapter, we will be discussing diabetes pathophysiology and how it impacts patient care. Diabetes is a chronic progressive disease. Over time, changes in insulin resistance and insulin secretion lead to the onset of type 2 diabetes. The three core pathophysiologic defects, insulin resistance in muscle, insulin resistance in liver, and beta cell dysfunction are responsible for the progressive nature of the disease. The insulin resistance in liver results in excessive hepatic glucose production and is responsible for fasting hyperglycemia, while the insulin resistance in muscle is responsible for postprandial hyperglycemia. Before the onset of diabetes, there is a compensatory increase in insulin secretion that precisely offsets the severity of the insulin resistance as shown on this slide by the navy blue line in the top graph and glucose levels remain normal. As the beta cell dysfunction worsens, as shown by the maroon line in the top graph, insulin secretory capacity falls, impaired glucose tolerance or IGT and hyperglycemia become apparent, and overt type 2 diabetes develops. As evidenced by the light blue and black lines in the bottom graph, glucose levels increase steadily both pre- and postprandially as the individual progresses from normal glycemia to type 2 diabetes. By the time that diabetes is clinically diagnosed, beta cell function is severely reduced. Now let's take a closer look at the beta cell dysfunction in patients with type 2 diabetes, which occurs early in the development of the disease. Patients with normal glucose tolerance and a 2-hour plasma glucose concentration between 110 and 140 mg per deciliter already have a greater than 50% decline in the plasma insulin response to a glucose challenge. Patients with IGT and a 2-hour plasma glucose concentration between 140 to 199 mg per deciliter manifested a severely impaired plasma insulin response. In this population, the data indicate that the onset of beta cell dysfunction occurs early in the natural history of type 2 diabetes, long before the onset of impaired glucose tolerance. This pattern is observed regardless of whether plasma insulin response was measured early, from 0 to 30 minutes, or overall, from 0 to 120 minutes during the oral glucose tolerance test. Importantly, the decline in beta cell dysfunction is progressive throughout the natural history of type 2 diabetes. At the whole body level, type 2 diabetes is a complex metabolic disease including multiple organs including adipose tissue, muscle tissue, the liver, pancreas, gastrointestinal tract, the nervous system, kidneys, and hormones such as insulin, amylin, glucagon, and the incretins. These multiple defects collectively contribute to the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes, and I have referred to them as the ominous octet. Specifically looking at hormonal dysfunction, the progressive decline in pancreatic beta cell function leads to a decrease in insulin secretion. Alpha cell hypersecretion of glucagon results in elevated fasting plasma glucagon levels leading to increased hepatic glucose production in patients with type 2 diabetes. Furthermore, type 2 diabetes leads to both deficiency in and resistance to the insulin stimulatory effects of incretin hormones produced in the gut. Looking at organ dysfunction, Insulin resistance in the liver of patients with type 2 diabetes results in overproduction of glucose despite elevation in the fasting plasma insulin concentration. In the muscle of patients with type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance results in impaired glucose uptake 
following carbohydrate ingestion leading to postprandial hyperglycemia. In the kidney, the plasma glucose concentration at which glucose spills into the urine, called the renal threshold for glucose, is increased in type 2 diabetes, resulting in decreased urinary glucose excretion. Fat cells contribute to the elevated plasma free fatty acid levels, causing beta cell failure and aggravation of the insulin resistance in muscle and liver. Finally, insulin resistance in the brain contributes to increased food intake in obese patients with type 2 diabetes. Let's now take a look at some of the complications that are associated with hyperglycemia based on recent national surveys. As shown on this slide, individuals with type 2 diabetes have an increased risk of both microvascular and macrovascular complications. The relative risk of lower extremity amputation was 10.5-fold, end-stage renal disease 6.1-fold, acute myocardial infarction 1.8-fold, and stroke 1.5-fold increased. Even at the time of diagnosis, complications are present in many type 2 diabetic patients. According to a 2007 report by the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, based on the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey from 1999 to 2007 data, the majority of patients had one or more complications at the time of screening demonstrating the harmful effects of hyperglycemia. Specifically, approximately three out of five people with type 2 diabetes aged 50 to 75 years, or 57.9%, had at least one or more complications. The data on this slide are from the UK PDS study, a prospective observational study in patients with newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes that aimed to determine if improved glycemic control could reduce the risk of diabetic complications. This study showed that for every 1% decrease in A1C, there was a 37% reduction in microvascular risk and a 14% decrease in the risk of myocardial infarction. Epidemiologic and prospective studies suggest that early and intensive metabolic control can influence clinical outcomes long after the therapy is discontinued or reduced in intensity, a phenomenon referred to as metabolic memory. Potential mechanisms for propagating this metabolic memory have been described and are displayed on this slide. First, intracellular hyperglycemia causes overproduction of superoxide. Superoxide activates several molecular pathways involved in the pathogenesis of diabetic complications, including increased formation of polyols, advanced glycation end products, activation of protein kinase C, and increase in hexosamine levels. Activation of these pathways leads to persistent oxidative stress that can alter gene expression even after glycemia is normalized thereby contributing to the development of diabetic complications. These data suggest that early aggressive treatment may minimize long-term diabetic complications. This diagram depicts the results from an animal study which assessed the temporal relationship between the achievement of glycemic control and the number of capillary microaneurysms, a surrogate measure of diabetic retinopathy. Establishing good glycemic control early after diabetes onset almost completely prevented retinopathy in this model. When glycemic control was postponed many months after the onset of diabetes, the number of capillary microaneurysms increased significantly. When glycemic control was established after a period of hyperglycemia, but before any evidence of retinopathy was present, the damaging effects of elevated glucose levels were lessened but not prevented. In summary, good glycemic control was decidedly less effective in preventing diabetic retinopathy if postponed for many months after the onset 
of diabetes. Ten-year follow-up data from the United Kingdom Prospective Diabetes Study demonstrated that improved glucose control led to a reduction in microvascular risk compared to conventionally treated individuals despite early loss of between-group differences in glycemic control. This graph shows the proportion of patients with microvascular disease in the conventional therapy group who received information about diet and exercise versus type 2 diabetic patients treated with a sulfonylurea plus insulin. The A1C was similar between groups after the first year of follow-up. However, at 10 years, the risk reduction for microvascular complications in the sulfonylurea plus insulin group was 24%. This reduction of microvascular risk provides support for the early initiation of glucose control. Before we conclude, I want to summarize a few key points. Type 2 diabetes is a complex and progressive disease with multiple hormone and organ dysfunctions contributing to its pathophysiology. Furthermore, studies show that prolonged hyperglycemic exposure results in increased risk of complications. In future chapters of this series, we will discuss how pathogenic abnormalities discussed here influence the clinical management of type 2 diabetes and the benefits of early proactive treatment. Thank you for joining today and be sure to listen to Chapter 2, Challenges in Diabetes Management.